Hello, my name is Hee Jung. I'm a member of the OHVM Sustainability and Environmental Action Group. And today I'm here to talk about how can we reduce the carbon footprint of the OHVM annual meeting. So thank you so much for joining. Well, we're super excited to meet our fellow scientists at Montreal. We know that aviation is a problem. A transcontinental flight for a conference leaves a huge amount of carbon footprint. So let's talk about the data and really get into this sort of hand wavy um, problem at this point. CO2 emissions in metric tons is a unit that I'll be using to show you the data. And here, what I'm showing you is an average citizen that uh, the carbon footprint that an average citizen emits over the course of a year. So a US citizen on average produces about 15 tons of carbon emissions, um, eight tons for a German citizen and 0.1 tons for a Uganda citizen. And all this data is according to, a, uh, according to the World Resources Institute. So again, this is the amount of carbon emissions that one individual produces over the course of 365 days. And to put that flight, the flight that we take to attend a conference into perspective, 11 tons would be emitted if you take a flight from London to Sydney round trip, which occurs in about one or two days. So this is a huge amount if you compare those two numbers. And so academics definitely do have this responsibility to act upon the aviation footprint, but because while we're here to discuss scientific ideas, intellectual stimulant, uh, the, the whole idea of having the fun exchanges with your fellow scientists, we are leaving a lot of carbon footprint, blowing all that up within one day. So if we don't act upon it, who would, especially because our climate scientists are talking about climate change, we do have a responsibility to act upon it. And so with that, here comes our outline of the day. Um, I will talk about the factors that influence the carbon footprint of OHBM annual meetings. And from that, once we identify the factors, we as scientists can talk about the solutions and act upon those, those reasons behind the carbon footprint. So what approaches can we take to reduce the meeting's environmental impact? And lastly, of course, we'd love to hear what you think because OHBM is sustained through the membership and so forth, your opinions really do matter. So let your voices be heard. Okay, so jumping right into the factors, here's a plot of the carbon emissions from the past OHBM meetings. And on the x-axis, we have locations, plotting Singapore, Vancouver, Honolulu, Rome, and the online meetings. On the y-axis, colored in yellow in the bar plots, we have CO2 emissions, in metric tons. And on the other side of the y-axis, we're also indicating the number of attendees over the course of the many years that we had. And so everything is ordered in terms of number of attendees. And just by eyeballing it, you might see a pattern, which is that there's not a strong correlation between the number of attendees and the amount of carbon emissions. What we're seeing is that, of course, when everything was online, um, that the carbon emissions was zero. And um, that allowed us to have many attendees, almost 4,000 comparable to 3,000 when it was in Singapore. The second thing that we wanna note is that when comparing Vancouver versus Honolulu, when the number of attendees were pretty comparable, the emissions are drastically different, almost two folds for Honolulu in terms of the uh, carbon dioxide that comes from traveling over plane. And to compare this with the Uganda citizen or the German citizens, um, this amounts to about 2,000 German citizens that they would emit over the course of a year. So that is a huge amount of carbon emissions. And so now the hypothesis becomes, okay, maybe Honolulu is really far away from where the majority of the membership lives, and you're asking them to take really long distance flights. So what we did was layer in the long haul flight data in, and this really does run our point home. Um, it confirms our hypothesis that when we compare it with Vancouver, where most of the uh, long haul flights, super long haul flights were only covering about 50% of the carbon emissions, Honolulu was drastically driven by these super long haul flights covering up the majority of the emissions. And so if there is a certain location where a lot of the uh, members have to travel, 
with super long haul flights, you're asking them to burn a lot of fossil fuels, which amounts to this amount of um, metric tons of emissions. The third thing that I want to highlight is Rome. Rome is interesting because we do have a lot of uh, attendees, almost 4,000 compared to Honolulu, where it was 3,000 attendees. So lots of attendees, but smaller emissions. So that's sort of speaking to the fact that location does make a difference. Probably Rome was located very close to where the majority of the membership lives, and thereby you're asking less people to take those super long haul flights. But of course, another thing to note is that the number of attendees, just because of the sheer amount of attendees that we saw in Rome, of course, you're going to have a sheer amount of carbon footprint also left behind. So with that, the summary becomes, one, we saw that in-person meetings definitely lead to substantial amounts of carbon emissions compared to an online option. Two, location really does make a difference. When we compared Vancouver versus Honolulu, because of the, the location, you're asking a lot of people to fly long, long distance flights and thereby increasing the number of emissions, even though the attendees are comparable. And then lastly, the number of attendees do make a difference. Rome was a good example of that, where even though you are having a couple of savings because of the location, Still, because there were 4,000 attendees, you're still going to see a sheer amount of uh, carbon footprint. Okay, so with that, now we get to act upon it because we've seen the data, we've diagnosed the problem. Now let's brainstorm some approaches to reduce the OHBM's uh, environmental impact. And here are a couple of options that we brainstormed. This is really detailed in our paper, but for the interest of time, we're not going to go over them one by one. I will focus here today on hybrid and multi-hop options. Okay, so a hybrid option, you might be familiar with it because we did it with Glasgow. It's an option where in-person and virtual meetings both occur. You're providing both of the options. And um, from one other paper from Milan Clower, a geophysicist, what they did was calculate the amount of savings that you might have if you asked people to go for a virtual option. And in their case, asking 70% of the membership to attend online instead of traveling, you saw 39% of emissions reduced. And 39 is not a trivial number because we've seen that almost 2,000 German citizens, what they emit over the course of a year is burnt over the course of five days with an OHBM uh, conference. So 39% of emissions, if you can reduce that, that almost is the equivalent of a thousand global citizens, what they emit over the course of a year. Okay, so if we use that logic and apply it to OHBM, use the same calculation, we would see 29% of emissions reduced if 33% of the members attended online instead of traveling. And this is because OHBM is again, a global conference where a lot of people are doing um, transcontinental uh, travels. More and more members advocate for the hybrid option. Um, in a survey circulated in 2021 by OHBM, 64% of the membership said that they advocate for hybrid options. And you also see this um, from the Society of Neuroscience. They had a petition that called for action on climate crisis, talking about the aviation, um, the footprint coming from aviation for conference traveling. So this is not new. We're going to see more of this. OHBM, it's best to uh, be prepared for those sort of demands and really act upon it so that we can do a, a conference, which is also green. And of course, hybrid options, as we've, as we've all seen it, is more inclusive because it allows for early career researchers to attend these conferences where you, if you can't afford a really long distance travel, then you can attend it with a virtual option. Same things goes for uh, people who can't attend for time constraints like parents, childcare duties, and so forth. So we would be able to invite people who normally wouldn't be able to attend, but now attend because of that virtual option. Multi-hub is another option that we would really love to recommend. It's a case where, for instance, um, OHBM would have three locations at once, Chicago, Tokyo, and Rome, for example, just to cover the three areas, the three um, global areas where our membership resides. And um, this is not a new concept. 
KubeCon, one of the biggest conferences that sort of covers like Kubernetes and Docker containers and all that, they have two conferences, two multi-hub uh, situations where one was already held in Amsterdam, another one is coming up in Chicago, and they have a wait list of, of almost 2,000 participants. So it's a really popular conference. Multi-hub settings don't take it away, actually. I think it adds more to being a, uh, a more popular conference setting. So we can really learn from other people, other industries, and benchmark what settings they have. Okay, so we would love to talk about the benefits of multi-hub settings. 74% of the emissions are reduced. That is three-fourths of what we've seen. And it almost will be the equivalent of what 1,500 German citizens would emit over the course of a year. So that's a huge amount of savings. And of course, the financial costs are big, right? Because instead of traveling to one big location, now you get to go to a more closer location. Probably this location can be located in a smaller location because it doesn't have to accommodate 4,000 participants all at once. It can go to a smaller location and even lower down the demands on the hotel, lower down those costs as well, and again, become more inclusive because of that affordability. Okay, so these are one of the reasons why we advocate for multi-hub settings. And we also have a backup plan. In a parallel universe where none of these get implemented and we just stick with the traditional format, we still can make this format green. And this stems from the plot that we've seen earlier where we've seen, okay, we asked the membership to attend the Singapore location, Vancouver, Honolulu, and Rome, and we've seen that they make differences in the carbon emissions. So what if we ask the membership to hypothetically attend iteratively all of the global cities that are out there, and from that, we can identify which ones are climate-friendly versus which ones are not, depending on where the majority of the membership lives. So this is a plot showing you that. On the x-axis, we have CO2 emissions, and on the y-axis, we have destination location, um, indicated in terms of city and country. And a disclaimer, we are not here to advocate for a certain city or a certain country. We're just here to show what the data points to and sort out um, and also tell you that we can triangulate where the most climate-friendly city could be if we know where the majority of the membership comes from. And this is, again, another sort of segue into advocating the hybrid and the multi-hub options, because if you had multi-hubs, then this will be reduced even drastically. If we had hybrid options, then this would also be drastically reduced. So that's a summary of the thought process that we had behind this plot. First is location does matter. When we triangulate the locations that is closest to the majority of the membership, then we can really do have those savings. And inclusivity is another topic on our mind. Just because you're not close to where the majority of the membership lives doesn't mean that you get to be isolated, right? We always do want to include people who are in more distant locations, but them as asking them to travel out with long haul flights is also a sort of dangerous um, sort of option for, for the climate health. So hybrid and multi-hubs are definitely a reason why we advocate for that alternative because then it's a uh, it's the best of both worlds. You get to have a climate-friendly location, but you also get to include the people who are not able to attend on a regular basis. Okay, so with that, this is the these are the recommendations from CSIG in terms of how we want to see our OHBM move forward. We listed it thoroughly in our paper, so please check it out if you do if you are interested but I have distilled this into three take-home messages for today. Um, we've seen that flying to conferences definitely leave a huge amount of carbon footprint, so we'd love to reduce that. And some of the ideas that we had, we brainstormed that hybrid settings are definitely a must, right? Allowing that virtual option really does reduce a lot of carbon footprint and doing multi-hub options, asking people to travel to a closer location will really be a possible solution to reduce that carbon footprint. Lastly, the third th plot that we saw was climate-friendly locations. If we choose them, then that really does make a big difference. So we want to be proactive of identifying where the membership comes from, identifying the sentiment of the inclusivity idea, and making the hybrid and hub options more available in the future settings. Okay, so with that, um, this is my last slide. 
we really want to go towards a better future while having fun meeting our fellow scientists. So OHK, OHBM can be fun and stimulating while still be mi- being mindful about climate impact. And your voices really matter. We do want to know what the majority of the membership thinks about this idea. And from that, with that, we can push forward the alternatives with the momentum. So let us know what you think and let your voices be heard. And lastly, I would like to acknowledge our first author and the senior author. Many thanks to Samira Epp and Charlotte Ray, who have spearheaded this project, and also the Sustainability Environmental Action Group, who's been tremendous um, being part of this great project. And lastly, of course, we cannot thank the OHB in 2023 organizers enough. Especially, I'd like to give a huge thanks to Winston Yang, who is the symposium organizer for making this talk possible. And thank you so much for your attention and your interest in this topic. Uh, Let us know what you think. Thank you.